What is happening in Israel? What's happening in Jerusalem? How did we get from relative calmness to violent riots and missiles over Tel Aviv within a matter of days? I'm going to give you 10 key events from the past month that got us to where we are right now. But before I do, let's have a quick look at things on the macro level, meaning the political situation in Israel. Netanyahu has just failed to form a government and be the next prime minister. On the other hand, his opposers are making immense efforts to construct a coalition that would leave him out of office for the first time in 12 years. Second, Netanyahu is currently standing trial on three very severe criminal charges. His best chance to evade justice is to stay in power, be the one who's in charge of the Ministry of Justice, of the Minister of Justice, of judges, and anyone or anything that can affect his trial. A good friend of mine who's very much in the know says that if we think of Israeli politics as the house of cards, we are bitterly mistaken. It, it's much more like Veep. There's no mastermind nor ability to organize scams in such huge scales. I would disagree because experience has proven that Netanyahu has the ability to see several steps ahead of anyone else, abuse the system, and manipulate the media to his benefit in almost any scenario. Now, 10 key points in understanding why missiles are fired at Tel Aviv tonight. Number one, Sheikh Jarrah is a Palestinian neighborhood in East Jerusalem whose residents face constant threats of expulsion from their homes by far-right settler organizations aided by a racist law approved by the Supreme Court. Nonviolent weekly protests that have been held for years have been recently met with extreme police brutality over the past month. In one of them, an Israeli Knesset member was assaulted by police. The Sheikh Jarrah fight takes on headlines in the Palestinian street and all over Israel. Number two, on the first day of Ramadan, Jerusalem police had decided to block off the Damascus gate and forbid people from sitting on the steps next to the gate. We're talking about the main entrance to the Muslim quarter and Al-Aqsa, in the very heart of East Jerusalem. This has been done in the past as a response to riots, but doing this without any apparent reason on the most important month of the Muslim year, it's hard to mistake in it as anything but a provocation. After two weeks of conflicts with the local Muslim youth and a day after the police states that it would stay in place, the roadblocks are taken down arbitrarily by police. Number three, a Palestinian youth posts a TikTok video of him slapping a religious Jew, which causes other Palestinian youth to do the same. Number four, the biggest atrocity Netanyahu committed before this past election is making sure that the far-right Jewish supremacists enter the Knesset, represented by Itamar Ben-Gvir. Being outlawed for 40 years, Netanyahu made sure that the voices calling out to the forced expulsion of Palestinians, full-blown apartheid, and Arab genocide will again be heard in the corridors of the Israeli parliament. All of that, why? Because they would surely support him as prime minister. Number five, gaining this legitimacy, Jewish mobs affiliated with Ben Gvir have attacked Muslims, leftists, and journalists without any significant reaction from the Jerusalem police. Palestinians react by clashing with police, which reacts with massive force. Number six, Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian president, decides to postpone the elections in the P Palestinian Authority. His excuse is that Israel wouldn't allow East Jerusalemite Palestinians to participate in the elections. It's true that Israel could have let them participate since they don't have the right to vote in Israel anyway, but it's still just a lame excuse aimed at retaining power. Abbas represents Fatah in the Palestinian arena, and his actions infuriate Hamas, who is in charge of Gaza. And voila, here's your smoking gun at Act 1. Number 7. Last week, Ben Gvir openly sets office in Sheikh Jarrah. This would be the equivalent of a grand wizard setting up office in the heart of Harlan. Palestinians riot, police reacts with force, it's Ramadan, the streets are on fire, and this obviously was funneled to El Aqsa. Police storms the compound and more than 200 Palestinians are injured in clashes with police the following day. 
people know that Hamas is already involved in inciting the Palestinian street as they share the exact same interest as Netanyahu. Violence and fear leave them in power. Number eight, on Saturday, dozens of buses of Israeli Muslim worshippers, among which are elderly people, women and children, make their way up to Jerusalem to pray in Al-Aqsa for Ramadan. The police blocks off the highway going up to Jerusalem and forbids them from continuing with the excuse of having people on board that came to incite violence. Even the Israeli media that usually lines up with the official version of the police was mocking it. People get off the buses and start marching to Jerusalem in their own pilgrimage. Muslim bus drivers from the area volunteered to drive them up to Jerusalem on the other side of the roadblock. The police attacks with stun grenades again, but realizes it is lost. They eventually arrested 20 people and let all the buses continue, but the damage was done. Number nine, yesterday, May 10th, was Jerusalem Day. Every year on Jerusalem Day, Israeli Jews gather to celebrate the reunification of Jerusalem by marching with the Israeli flags through the old city. Sounds nice, doesn't it? In reality, thousands of men, mainly religious Jews affiliated with the settler movement, march through the heart of the Muslim quarter, chanting racist slogans much more than a demonstration of love for Jerusalem. It's a demonstration of Jewish supremacy and dominance over the Palestinian population, which shuts down the heart of Muslim Jerusalem. Imagine a KKK rally through the streets of Harlem and locking off the residents in order to let the march go through. At the very last moment, the march is diverted by Netanyahu's orders in spite of the chief of police and the minister of internal security pushing to hold it as planned. At the same time, police storms the El Aqsa compound again and riots begin. The police does the exact opposite of what it takes to bring down the flames. They storm the mosques with stun grenades. Now think of the symbolism of Israeli police already considered an occupying force in East Jerusalem on the holiest month of the year, in the third holiest place for Islam, treading the carpets with their boots in a place where you're supposed to walk barefoot out of respect. You have to be very naive in order to think that the highly experienced Jerusalem police is trying to contain the riots. 300 Palestinians are wounded and what the chief of police had to say afterwards is that they weren't firm enough. Number 10. Hamas sends an ultimatum to Israel that if police doesn't withdraw from Al-Aqsa and from Sheikh Jarrah until 6 p.m., they'd fire at Jerusalem. Six o'clock comes around and there you go. The smoking gun fires at Jerusalem. Netanyahu has to react forcefully. The IDF immediately bombed in Gaza, killing at least 20 people, nine of which are children. Netanyahu declares that it's going to take some time to fight Hamas this time. Some of the Jewish-Israeli opposition leader hasten to support the attack on Gaza so they don't appear weaker than Netanyahu. And now we're getting to the bottom line. This new coalition can only be formed by partnering with at least one of the two Arab parties in the Knesset. But how can they join a coalition where their would-be partners support the killing of the, their Gazan brothers and sisters? Mansour Abbas, the leader of one of the Arab parties, who is already considered in, has declared that he's suspending negoci negotiations until the assault ends. Lapid, the leader of the would-be coalition, has stated that if the situation escalates or prolongs, the coalition wouldn't be able to form. That means we might go to another election. That means that Netanyahu remains in power. The most sophisticated scam artist in Israel has done it again as everybody dances to his tunes instead of making their own music. If you look at each of these incidents separately, it seems like another day in the Middle East. If you connect the dots and look at the outcome, the conclusion is clear. A personal assistant to Netanyahu has recently testified that he knows Netanyahu would stop at absolutely nothing in his attempts to remain in power. In the meanwhile, the riots have spread out across mixed cities in Israel, including Haifa, Jaffa, and Ramle. Muslim mobs attacked Jews yesterday. Jewish mobs attacked Muslims today. Hamas has been firing hundreds of missiles to central Israel, and Israel has been bombing heavily in Gaza. Right now, 
every person between the Jordan and the Mediterranean is being held hostage by a lunatic who would sacrifice everything and anyone in order to stay prime minister.